Hello and welcome to another coding challenge. Uh, in this coding challenge, I am going to look at the reaction diffusion algorithm. So I have a version of it running right over there. That is a processing sketch that has implemented the reaction diffusion algorithm. I'm going to implement it in JavaScript, uh, do it from scratch in this video. And you can see that this allows you to create this interesting kind of labyrinthian uh, a visual in your canvas. Now there's a lot of different ways that you can apply colors and get different qualities to the image, but I'm gonna look at the sort of core classic reaction diffusion algorithm using the Gray Scott model. I will include some links below to reference pages. The one that I will build the code based on is right here in the browser, the Carl Sims, a Carl Sims tutorial page. Um, and so the idea here is that I'm going to just sort of look at the drop dead simple classic algorithm, black and white pixels only, and then hopefully you, after watching this and using the code, might come up with some other creative uses and applications of it. So let's try to understand first what this algorithm actually is. And so I'm going to close this window out and look at this diagram. So the idea of reaction diffusion is kind of like you have your screen and you're about to pour some chemicals into it and those chemicals are going to react and there's going to be a lot of chemical A and then less of chemical B and they're going to react and diffuse and that sort of thing. And then based on the, how those chemicals are arranged in the screen, in this sort of like dish, petri dish of your canvas, I'm gonna, we're gonna set a color. So if there's a lot of chemical A, we're gonna make the pixel black. If there's no chemical A, we're gonna make the pixel white and kind of everywhere in between. So that's the idea here. Now there are a lot of different um, kind of key pieces here. And let's just look at this quick diagram here. Thank you again, Carl Sims, for providing the diagrams for this video. Um, chemical A, so, um, the way it's going to work is the canvas is going to be filled with chemical B. And then we're going to start to pour chemical A into the canvas. The reaction aspect is chemical A and B reacting, and maybe A is turning into B. And the sort of diffusion in this way is that chemical B is also going to get kind of like removed uh, from it. So there are, some, there are some key constants in the system that are numbers that you're going to see in the code. One is the feed rate, which is how fast are we pouring in chemical A. And then another is called the kill rate. I wish there was a nicer name for that, but that's what it's called, which is how, what is the rate that chemical B is being removed. So this is the idea. Now, um, <clears throat> So, and you can see here, what we're going to do is each, each cell is going to have a certain amount of chemical A and amount of chemical B, and those values are going to have a range between 0 and 1. Uh, 1 being a lot of chemical A, 0 being none, and then that amount is going to be used to set the color for a pixel. And so you can see here uh, how, this, how this kind of works. Again, we're going to have to do all this in code. Now, how, look at this, now we have this like terrifyingly <laughs> scary looking formula. But we can tackle this formula. I'm going to, right here, I'm here with you to tackle this complicated looking formula. So let's put, putting that aside, let's kind of make a quick diagram. So the way that I'm going to build this in code is I'm going to have a two-dimensional array, meaning I'm going to have a data structure that's going to keep track of uh, each spot in that data structure is going to keep track of an individual cell. Call that a cell. Each cell is going to have an amount of chemical A and an amount of chemical B. So what I need to do is understand uh, if, chem if there are moments in time, there are generations, this moment in time, next moment in time. So moment in time A0, moment in time B0, what I need to understand is how do I get the amount of A for moment in time 1 based on some function of the amount of A and the amount of B at time 0. So this is what we're looking at. And in fact, over here, that's what this formula is showing you. The new value of A equals all this stuff based on the previous value of A and B and some other constants. So this is what we need to do. But there's a bit more to it than this. So you know, I could say like, oh, A1 equals the average of A0 plus B0 you know, divided by 2. This could be our formula. This would be a lot easier to implement. So that formula is just like this, but a lot more complicated. So now, but there, the reason why there's more to it than this is because we have this scenario here of an individual cell. We have to apply something called a convolution. You're going to see, I'm going to show you in a moment, it says a convolution of a 3 by 3 matrix. All this scary sounding stuff. So here is a 3 by 3 matrix. And this is a given cell. And what I want to know is what is this cell's new values of A and B based on its previous value of A and B. But not just it, I need to know also based on its neighbors. So these chemicals are reacting and combining 
in a given cell also with what are the chemicals next to it. So the con a convolution means take every single one of these cells and multiply it by some weight. So if I were blurring an image, for example, I could use a blur as uh, blur meaning the average of a convolution of a, of, a, of a three by three matrix of pixels. So the new pixel color is going to be an average one ninth of this color plus one ninth of this color plus one ninth of this color plus one ninth of this color. So I take all of the colors and multiply them by one ninth, add them all together, and I have the new color. But we have a different um, convolution here, and it's described in in, in the diffusion uh, in the reaction diffusion algorithm. So this is the basic idea. I need a two dimensional array. Each spot is going to have a certain amount of A and a certain amount of B. I need to have a formula that for each cycle, each frame through draw, I get a new value of A and a new value of B, and then a new value of A and a new value of B. And the math formula is going to be something like this, but more complicated because it's also going to involve all the neighbors. So let's start setting this up now. Hopefully this is the basic idea. Let's start setting it up to program it. OK, so now I'm back over here. Uh, I am back over here. Ah! Oh, was I not over there the whole time? I think I was over there the whole time. Hopefully this was right. Uh. Somebody in the chat tell me, was I in the, on the whiteboard while I was showing that? Um, okay, so if I go back to, I have this uh, blank uh, code here. Um, and uh, I'm going to go to my uh, canvas here, and this is my canvas. So the first thing I need to do is create, okay, I was, good. The first thing I need to do is create my uh, two-dimensional array to store all the amount, the, the amount of chemicals in each spot in the, in the grid. Okay, so two-dimensional arrays in JavaScript are kind of a funny thing. Uh, not funny, haha, <laughs> funny a little bit weird, because um, arrays in JavaScript, there's just so many different ways you can make them. But ultimately, what a two-dimensional array is, and let me kind of describe this to you briefly. I'm going to make an array called grid. And you can imagine, like, what if I did this? Um, I'm going to write something like this. I'm just going to kind of type something out for a second just to explain this. This, my friends, you are my friends indeed, is a two-dimensional array. I, I kind of spaced it out like a grid, but really what it is is just an array of arrays. To see how it's an array, open square bracket, end square bracket, and then it's three arrays inside of it. But, I could, but so really a two-dimensional array in programming is just an array of arrays. So what I need is one array to keep an array for here, for here, for here, for here, right? So I need the first array to be the first row, the second array to be the second row, the third array to be the third row, that sort of thing. But I, I'm not going to type it out manually. For three by three, I could type it out manually. What I need to do is kind of, um, is actually make it, um, uh, make it in code. <laughs> okay, everything's going to be fine. So I'm going to create that variable. And I'm going to do it, I, I'm going to use a particular style I'm going to do it different. I'm going to do it a different. So what I'm going to do is I'm first just going to say grid is an array. It's an empty array. And what I need to do is I need to loop x equals 0. x is less than the width of this canvas. And let me zoom back out. x plus plus. So for every x and for every y, right? For every x, ah, stop. Oh, I can't. Uh, <laughs> I'm waiting for my auto format that's not here. Um, for every x, what I need to do is say grid index x is an array. So I start with this array and then I say, hey, let's make an array. And then what am I going to put here? Grid x y equals, now what do, I, what do I need in each spot in the grid? Now, if I were just, if I only had a single chemical, <laughs> if I only had a single chemical, I would just putting a single number in each one of these. But I have two chemicals, I have an A and a B. So let's actually, I think this is a place where I could just make a literal JavaScript object and say A is, you know, ha there's zero of A and there is a zero of B. So, uh, and you know, I, I don't think I need to be so long-winded about it. This is such a simple object. I'm going to do this. So I make each spot in the grid, each spot in the grid, for every x and every y, there's an a and a b with zero of each chemical. And I'm going to need to change that eventually. But we're going to start there. So this is good. I now have my grid. Yay. <laughs> now, here's the thing. In order to make this work, right, the whole, this whole, it's whole, all built on this idea of I need to get the next generation amount of a. So I can't be, met if, if this grid is the snapshot of all the chemicals in a current generation, 
I need a completely separate grid to start filling in the new values. Because if I were to use the same grid, if I start overwriting the values in that grid while I'm checking other values' neighbors, everything's gonna get all messed up. So what I should do is I'm also gonna create a variable here called next. And I'm gonna be kind of silly about it and I'm just gonna make two of these. And I'm gonna say next. So I now have two two-dimensional arrays. And I think I just want to briefly mention that um, I could have done this. So grid is going to be the current, and then next is going to be the next one. So I could have done this by also using new array in JavaScript to create a sort of fixed size, but I know my array should have a width and height as kind of the number of uh, columns and rows. Okay, so now we're in good shape. So what I could do, what I want to do is just sort of see that the basic idea of this is working. So what I need to do is draw a color, a pixel color in the window based on each value in that grid. So by the way, we're gonna need this double nested loop like a zillion times. So I'm gonna just copy paste that down here. And one, th one thing I'm gonna do at the very end is I'm gonna say load pixels. And then I'm going to uh, say update pixels. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, create a color. Let's just make sure, I'm going to just make a nice, you know, pinkish purplish color just to make sure this is working. And I'm going to say pixels index, oh boy. So guess what everybody? I have a whole video that goes through the pixel array. I should link to that from here. The pixel array in, Java, in P5.js in the JavaScript canvas is a pixel array that has four spots for every pixel. So I need to figure out, and it's one dimensional. So I go through the derivation of this formula, but I'm gonna say pix equals x plus y times uh, width times four. And then I'm gonna say pixels pix plus zero equals uh, 255. And I'm gonna, ch this I don't need. And I'm gonna say zero, and I'm gonna say 100. And then, gonna, and this is uh, one, one, two, and three. So what I've done here is I'm using a formula to find the right spot in that array for every single pixel, every width, every column, and every row. And then I'm saying, give, make its red 255, make its green zero, make its blue 100, make its alpha 255. So I just want to see that this runs. Okay, great. So I filled it with a color. So I do have a way of setting every pixel color. Now, what I want is for these colors to be based on the grid. So I'm going to say grid x comma y dot a, and I'm going to say grid x y dot b. So, um, so I'm going to do the red and the blue as coming from the two-dimensional array itself, and we should see all black, but if I give everything a uh, random amount, we should see, uh, okay, so what am I missing here? So I gave the grid a random amount of A and a random amount of B. And uh, what's missing? Oh, I, I did a random between zero and one. So I, what I want to do is multiply these by 255. And there's, there's lots of ways I could use color mode or get around this, but I'm just gonna multiply that by 255. Oh, and I'm gonna have to say floor because it has to be an integer, I bet. Uh, okay, so I, I probably could have done a better job at this, but there we go. So you can see that this is working. <laughs> I have a mechanism by which, based on the amount of chemicals, I get a pixel color. This is the core thing that we need. So now all we need to do is say like, okay, let's put this formula in. Great. So let's unpack this formula, right? Because right now, and, and actually, before we even do that, let's, let's actually just get the structure going. So before I put the formula in, let's do some, let's, put this nested loop in again. And what I want to say is now, I need to use this next, right? Next index x, y equals, and let me just do something like, I'm gonna make up a formula. This isn't the actual reaction diffusion formula, but what I'm going to do is, where's the camera, where's the screen? I'm losing my mind. I'm gonna say grid x comma, so next, dot a equals grid x y dot a you know times 0 0.2 and 
next, the, the next B is the grids B times 1.2. So I'm going to do that. So this is, this, again, this isn't the correct formula. We're going to have to actually put in the reaction diffusion formula, but I'm showing this is the structure by which I say the next generation will be that. So now if I run this again, up, oh, we come back to here. Well, it doesn't seem to be animating or changing. Why? So it's not animating or changing because I'm still drawing it based on grid. So maybe what I actually want to do is draw the next one. And I did get something strange happening here. So it looks different. And let's actually um, not let it go, the values go over. Let me so you can see that it is actually doing something, like the values are different. But <laughs> importantly here, I don't see anything animating. So one of the major things that we need here is, and let's think about it, is something called a swap. Are you with me? Are you still paying attention? I, I would understand if you weren't. OK, so I need a swap. So this is a very common technique in cellular automata systems and other types of generation by generation systems. What I have here is I have, oops, wrong side of this marker. What I have here is I have a two dimensional array called grid. And then I have one called next. So grid is all my starting values. Then next is calculated. And then next is drawn to the window. Well, what should next should then become grid again so I can get a new next and draw that to the window. So what I need to do is swap them. What I need to do is say, let me put next back into grid and then I have a new blank one to write on. And I could just pull grid over there because it's the old one, I don't need it anymore. So if I, if I want to have this continuous generation, I have the old and the new. So new gets calculated, then new becomes old, and I could just use that old one that I had to be the next new one. And then new becomes old, then, then new gets calculated, then new becomes old again. So I need to have a swap. So I'm actually going to write this as a separate function. So at the end of every, oops, after I draw, I'm going to call a function called swap, and I'm going to write that down. Can you see this? I'm going to write this down oh, somewhere down here. So I'm going to write a function and called swap. And so what's going on here? Next, I want grid to be next, and I want next to be grid. I want grid to be next, and I want next to be grid. I want to swap them. Oh, but this is no good. If grid is next, and then next equals grid, well, then next is next, because grid is next. We've got a problem here. So in a swap, what I need to do is I need to have a temporary variable that keeps track of the old grid. So now grid can become next, and next can become that old grid temp. So this is a very simple swapping algorithm to swap the values of two variables. Um, and that'll do the trick for me. So now if I swap them, this will get applied over and over again. So let's, let's do 0.9 and 0.8, just so we see something happening here. And you can see it, it, it went down to 0 very quickly. Um, and I could, um, you know, I could say 0.95, and I could try doing 1.01. So you can see it's going towards it's going to go towards blue eventually. So we can see we have the system going on. Now again, this isn't this is the like Schiffman rainbow reaction diffusion algorithm, which isn't very interesting at all. So we have the guts here. We have the foundation. We have the two-dimensional array. Each spot holds the amount of each chemical. The screen is colored based on those chemicals. And I have some formula to calculate the new chemical value based on the old chemical value. So I don't know how long I've been doing this for, but we're so close now. All I need to do is actually go and get that scary formula uh, from that web page and stick it in the code, and we're done. So let's go take a look at that. And this is going to be a bit more difficult <laughs> than I might have imagined. But let's see, how it, let's see how it goes. So now we're back to here. So let's look at all of these things. OK, A, the difference of uh, the new A equals what A? So let's start putting this in. Uh, so this we can do. Difference of A equals new A. So I'm going to go back. And um, I'm going to probably need a lot more space here. So, um, and I'm just going to do A for a second. The new A, right, equals what? The old A. Now I'm going to go back to this formula. Plus, plus, and now what? DA. What is DA? Oop. I can't operate the computer sometimes. I went back by accident. DA is the diffusion rate. 
So where are those? Here we go. These are some typical values. So this, by the way, is something that you're going to, after you watch this video and use this example, you're going to want to like play around with these values yourself or go look up other values. The different values will produce different kind of results. So diffusion rate of A is 1. So I'm going to, in my code, I'm going to make these uh, global variables. DA equals 1. Let's see what else we got. Uh, DB equals 0.5. Diffusion rate for B. The feed, feed is how fast are you feeding in chemical A is 0 0.055. I'm going to call that feed just to, because F uh, can mean other stuff in programming. 0 0.055, was that it? Yep. And K is 0 0.062. Uh, var K equals 0 0.062. That's, that's sort of the, the, the kill rate, how, how fast is a B being removed. Um, so these are the values that I'm going to need in that particular formula. So now I can go back here and say uh, plus the diffusion rate of A times mm, Laplace, upside down triangle, Laplace 2D function. Uh, okay, so let's, let's make that something temporarily that we're going to deal with in a little bit. So I'm just going to say right now, I'm going to say Laplace. I'm going to make that a function. <laughs> Laplace A, we're going to deal with that later. And uh, times A times, and, and you know what I should do to make this shorter? I think something that can make things a little easier is I can say A equals grid X, Y, A. So that way I don't have to, every time I need that A value, I can just put A times A times, uh, uh, mi oh no, minus, minus what? A times B squared. Uh, so A times B times B. And I'm going to, I need a variable for A. Boy, this is a lot of typing here. I guess you could fast forward now or put this on two times speed if you're watching this still. Uh, I kind of want to like put this on multiple lines. Also, just so you can see it. So, uh, whoops, no, this should be here. I'm going to do each piece of this formula on a different line. Uh, I don't know if this is making it uh, um, a minus. A times B times B. So we have A times the diffusion of A plus this Laplace thing I have to get to times A minus A times B times B. And then now we have plus the feed multiplied by 1 minus A. So plus the feed multiplied by 1 minus A. Did I get that right? Plus the feed multiplied by 1 minus A. And I'm going to put parentheses around these things, I think. I'm sure it's right anyway, but this I think will help us. A plus D, A, that doesn't seem right. A plus D, A times Laplace. So, I, I, so I'm going to, um, just to be consistent here, I'm going to move this down here. And uh, I think I now have all the components of that formula. A plus D, A times Laplace times A minus A times B times B plus feed times 1 minus A. Does that look right? Somebody watching this in the live stream will correct me. I think I've gotten this right. Um, and we will, uh, yeah, DA Laplace times A. Okay, so hopefully I got this right. And I have to do the same thing for B. Why not just do it right now that we're here? So B is B plus uh, the, the diffusion rate for B. And I'm going to make a Laplace B function, which is a little bit silly what I'm doing here, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, uh, times b, and then it is plus ab squared, plus ab squared, minus uh, minus k plus f times b, k plus feed times b. Okay, we're in good shape here. I put parentheses around this just to be consistent. So I think I now have. Um, so I think I now have these formulas. Now I, I did miss a crucial point. If you come back to this, you'll see delta t. Delta t is the change in time for each iteration. What does that mean? Well, the way the world works is that time marches forward on and on and on. The way that computer programs and animation programs work is. Time marches forward in time steps, lockstep. And how, and we're doing this calculation in this sort of like stop, calculate, wait, stop, calculate, wait, stop, calculate. So 
in, we could sort of scale the amount of time that's passing, scale the calculation according to time. I'm going to leave that as one, and basically my time scale is going to be the 60 frames per second that I hope that the um, that the uh, algorithm, uh, that I hope that the animation plays out at. But you can really sort of change the quality of what you're getting and the degree of accuracy that you're getting by having a smaller time step. So you might try 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.5, and see what you get. But I'm going to kind of just leave that out for right now for the, for the case of simplicity. OK, so we've done everything now except for this Laplacian thing. And so I'm realizing, by the way, that this is Laplacian A. This is not multiply by A. This is the Laplacian A thing. So one thing I can do is get rid of this times A and this times B. Um, so what is that? This is the convolution. So this is this particular thing. What I need to do in the Laplace function is look at the, every single amount of A in all of the neighbors. I need to multiply a weight and then add them all together to get the new value. That's the Laplacian function, the convolution. So if we go back here, let's go back to this page. And here it says, um, the Laplacian is performed with a three, now there's different ways you could do this, but this says with a three by three convolution with a center weight of negative one, adjacent neighbors 0.2 and diagonals 0.5. This means the following. So I need to, in this function, look at every single cell and apply a weight. 0 0.05, 0 0.2, 0 0.05, 0 0.2. Uh, this is the center one, negative 1. And then 0 0.2, 0 0.05, 0 0.2, 0 0.05. The diagonals get a weight of 0 0.05. The adjacents get a weight of 0 0.2. And the center gets a weight of negative 1. We're trying to determine the difference between that center cell and its neighbors. And you notice it's in a way these have higher weights because it's like the adjacent ones are closer to it than the diagonals. So those chemicals are going to play a larger role in the reaction. And you could try messing around with different values. Now, there are all sorts of fancy ways I could write another nested loop and kind of use some sort of uh, other two-dimensional array to keep track of the weights. I probably should do that. But I'm going to be a little bit lazy right now and just do this in a very hard-coded manual way. So let's look at how I might do that. Um, so if I come back here, first of all, let's just write, um, so down here I'm going to need a function called Laplace A, and I'm also going to need a function called Laplace B. And I'm just going to do something right now. I'm going to just say they return the value 1, which is obviously like wildly incur. oh boy, I'm not here. Uh, so I need to add these two functions. Sorry, I lost, I didn't get back here. I need to add these two functions, and I'm just for right now for simplicity to make sure my code runs, just say that they return the number 1. So that this should do something, and I should get something, um, and I should get something. So let's run this. And you can see, okay, so something's working, and you can almost even like see it, oops, see it like flicker and do something weird and interesting for a second. So that's good. The other thing I want to change, by the way, and I'll deal with this later though. Let's leave that now. Okay, so but now I need to actually do the correct Laplace function. So what I think I'll do is pass into Laplace the function, the current x and y. And then I'm going to do the entire calculation in that function. And I need to do it with the grid, right? So what I need to do is say something like the sum for a is 0. And then what I need to do is say sum a plus equal, OK, what's the center? The center is grid x, y times that weight, negative 1. So I need to do this like nine times for all nine neighbors. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So the adjacent ones are all multiplied by 0.2. So adjacent to the left is x minus 1. Adjacent to the right is plus 1. So these get multiplied by 0.2. Then uh, above and below is y plus 1 and y minus 1. Those get multiplied by 0 0.2, 0 0.2. Now I need to do all the diagonals. Again, this is like a kind of terrible manual way of doing it, but it's, and I could do this in a loop in a much nicer way, but I think this is good for figuring it out. Uh, minus 1, minus 1, 0 0.05. That's uh, up and to the left. Plus 1, minus 1. And I just need the same value for each one of these. Uh, uh, okay, then I need, uh, I need plus 1, plus 1, and then a minus 1, minus 1. Does that seem right to you? Did I get, oh, no, 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 I already did minus 1. Minus 1, plus 1. So I have, oh, boy, I've been doing this for a half an hour. That's, that's not good. 
Um, okay, <laughs> Look, this is turning out to be a very long video. I should have done it in multiple parts, but it's too late now. Okay, so uh, minus one, minus, 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 plus, minus, plus, plus, minus, plus. That's all four. So I think I've gotten this right, and then I just need to return, and I need to get those x, y values as arguments, and then I need to return that sum a. Uh, and then, Oh, and I'm not returning that whole object. I'm not adding that. I'm, I'm adding the A amount for each one of these. And you know, so I could do this in a more clever way by also having it be one function to add these objects together. So now I'm just going to do the Laplace. And I could even like do a function that knows whether it's doing Laplace or A or B. But again, I'm just going to do this completely the totally manual way. And we can do another video. I'm going to, I can make this just a few lines of code. And I'm just going to be sitting here. Ah, Come on, Sublime. It's, try, it's trying to be way too smart for me. I just want to, I don't want you to give me suggestions. Sometimes I want suggestions, sometimes I don't want suggestions. And this is silly now that I called it this, but I did, so I'm going to go all the way through with it. Okay, so now we should, we've got these Laplace functions. I'm doing the convolution for every x and y. I'm adding up all the neighbors and the weights. So that should go right into this formula. And honestly, I think we might be done. <laughs> I'd be shocked if this actually works. We're going to have to debug what we missed, but let's run it. I, I know this kind of, okay, so sketch, ah, great. Why? I love what just happened here. So what just happened here? Cannot read property zero of undefined. So I have, I, I could kind of try to figure out what's going on. Let's look at sketch.js line 65. Um, so down here, there's an issue. Here's the issue, x minus one. When is x minus 1 going to be a completely invalid spot in the grid? It's a completely invalid spot if x is 0, because there's no negative 1. So I could do some sort of wraparound thing or whatever, but I think what would be easiest here would just be to say, hey, you know what, for this calculation, I'm not going to do the edge pixels. I'm going to start at 1, and I'm going to go to width minus 1 and height minus 1. So I'm actually going to ignore the edge pixels so I don't have that issue. So that should fix that. Now I'm going to run it, and look at this. Something kind of crazy happened. So I think I've got the algorithm going here. I, I'm a little worried I have a mistake, but the most, mostly the problem right now is that I haven't really seeded this, this in a way that makes sense. So I think the traditional way these are done, let's look here, is right, I'm giving the grid all random values is what I think would make sense would be to fill it with B, right? I want to fill the grid with B. Let's run this. It's blue and it, uh, or it kind of turned red. That's interesting. That's not what I expected to happen. But I'm going to just leave that that. And then what I want to do is I want to give one spot. Like I'm going to say, I'm going to override that. I'm going to say like uh, 100, 100 dot A actually has a, a ball out of A in it. So I fill the grid with B and no A. And then I give one spot. I, I pour in a little A in that one spot. Why am I getting this? That's so interesting that I'm getting this weird square thing. So I must have messed something up. Do -do 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 -do. Hello, I'm back. I don't know where I would, that's going to get edited somehow. Um, so here's the issue. I just, I, I wanted to add like a little bit of B, like I filled the whole thing with A. I actually switched that from when I was maybe last in this video. So I filled the whole thing with A and then I want to add a little bit of B, but that's not going to work. Just like a one little droplet of B on one pixel, not going to get enough reaction diffusion to make anything happen. I actually need to give it a, blo a block of like, I need to pour a lot more in. So I need like a little area of, so what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to say uh, for, and I'm going to use I here just to use a different, like I equals 100, I is less than 10, I plus plus. No, I is less than 110, I plus plus. Now, how you seed the system is like super interesting, and I'm doing this not in a very interesting way, but I'm going to use J, uh, J++. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a whole area and give it some B, like a little 10 by 10 pixel area. So every pixel from between 100 to 110 is going to get some B, right? Every pixel is going to start with a lot of A and no B, and then this little 10 by 10 area is going to start with B. And what I'm actually going to do is, just for a second, comment this out. So let's just see what this looks like. Now, why am I, I'm getting this crazy flickering. You can't see that, actually. Interestingly enough, I don't think the flickering is showing up, because I've done something wrong with my rendering. <laughs> but you can see, though, that, ooh, 
Whoa, oh, now you're seeing interest. I don't know what you're actually seeing on the stream. Um, oh boy, this is a really, this was a much harder one than I imagined, but I'm gonna put this back in. I'm gonna figure out what the flickering is there, why the flickering is happening. Okay, so you can see this is now finally working. Um, I'm getting a weird flickering around the edges. Oh, oh, I know what the problem is. I know what the problem is. Because I'm not updating the edges, the edges need to make sure they're seated with the original amount of stuff. There we go. Finally, we're good. So it took me a little while there, but the issue was that I needed to place an area of, of pixels um, in order to, to, to seed it with some chemical B. So uh, this, was, this was much, this would have been good. This would have benefited from, this would benefit from a second run. Like I could just do this whole thing again and probably get through it a lot faster with less uh, hiccups. But hopefully this helped you. You can see now I now have the reaction diffusion simulation. You can see this is one little area of pixels. Um, and you know, what happens if you give it like a, like a circular area of pixels or start stuff with like random values? What kind of patterns might you get? And you can see the reaction diffusion algorithm is kind of blossoming into this nice little flower. We can let it run for a little bit. I'm curious about the frame rate. Uh, I, I'm, it's JavaScript is handling this pretty well. Is this only 200 by 200 pixels? Um, so it isn't, um, it isn't a tremendous amount of pixels for it to work with. But so you might run into some serious performance issues if you do this in the browser. It's gonna run a lot faster in processing. Of course, I'm sure there's like fancy shader WebGL ways of doing this super, super fast. But um, I think this kind of wraps up this tutorial. So to recap, just now that we've kind of like, just wanna use this last few minutes to kind of recap what I've got is uh, here, we started out with, uh, in the code, we're just gonna walk through all the pieces of the code now. There is the grid, which stores the amount of A and B chemicals across every pixel. There are all these constants, which are associated with the Gray-Scott implementation. So there's a, an amount of diffusion for A, an amount of diffusion for B, there's a feed rate and a kill rate. So you can look up different values for those, like known values that produce different patterns. You can also just play with those yourself. Then I have to create these two-dimensional arrays. I need a current and a next, because I gotta calculate the next generation and then use the current as the next generation, then use it as the next. I've got this cycling going on, and I'm starting and filling it, each spot with all chemical A and no B. Then I start a little area of pixels, the 10 by 10 area of pixels to put some chemical B in. And this is another place where you, wanting to play with this code, you should try something different. Like, what if you fill in around the contours of a silhouette and you start getting this like silhouetted person reaction diffusion pattern? Then in draw, I do a bunch of things. Number one is I just actually implement that reaction diffusion formula. I need to calculate the next amount of A and B based on the current amount of A, the diffusion rate, the feed, the kill rate, all of that stuff, as well as this sum of all of the neighbors. So the sum of all of the neighbors happens in these Laplace functions, and that is lower down in the code. Again, I would suggest, and I'd be happy to do this and post this at some point if someone wants to remind me, modified version, I could condense this into one function and I could also make this happen in a loop. But I think this really shows exactly what's happening. And these weights, again, are defined by the Sims uh, page. You could, use, you could weight things, or you could have a five by five matrix, you could do different things there. So that's calculating all those next values. And then here, the only thing that's happening here is I'm now setting every single pixel in the window a color based on the amount of A and the amount of B. And I'm just using black and white. So it's up to you. I think I could go back, you could say, well, the amount of A could be the amount of blue, the amount of B could be the amount of the green. You could, you could create rainbow cycling colors. Somebody make a rainbow reaction diffusion thing. Um, there's a lot of possibilities there for how you could play with this. But this is all of the code. I think this is probably a 40 to 45 minute video, I'm assuming at this point. Um, and so uh, please play with this, uh, send me your feedback, send me your comments, and um, let me know how it goes. Thanks for watching.